recording the session and everybody is good. So ev hello everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to Dermaspark Academy and today we are going to talk, as everybody knows, we are going to talk about uh, the trilipo. Uh, we understand that everybody is back to work at this time and uh, not necessarily everybody is available for the call, so of course we are going to record it and for those one that cannot participate, uh, we will have the recording ready. Uh, as, we be, as we are back to work, we thought about the, the appropriate time to do this, these seminars and the idea was to do it on Mondays, that usually spas and skin care uh, clinics are closed. And to do it not at six o'clock because this is dinner, but right after dinner at seven, seven o'clock, which is four o'clock Vancouver time. And of course, this is uh, eight o'clock uh, uh, maritime time. If anyone has any comment about it or has any idea, please let us know. We will be very happy to listen to any comment and to uh, set it to the right time when it's comfortable for everybody. So without further ado, uh, Doron, the stage is yours. Uh, you want me to unmute you. Okay. This can be done. You are on. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Moshi. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being here with us for another episode of the Dermas Park Academy. And as Moshi said, Today we're going to talk about the trilipo in the context of body contouring, and this will be our main focus uh, for the day. Just a moment. There we go. So we have, as usual, we have quite a busy agenda. Oh, and I apologize for not uh, sharing uh, my video. It's just that today we are having a bad connection uh, day here with the, in the office, so um, I don't want to cause any trouble. Anyway. Uh, the, the agenda for today is a little bit busy, and I know that uh, it's already late um, uh, in uh, Eastern uh, territories, and uh, what we're going to do, we are going to start with a brief introduction to the trilipo technology and how it works. If you already know about it, then great. If you don't, then this will be a quick uh, um, explanation or um, yeah, like a brief introduction to the trilipo. Uh, and then we are going to dive into more details with the fat physiology and lipolysis and cellulite and butt lift. All that jazz uh, will come later and we will say a few words about the combination between the trilipo and uh, cryolipolysis. And eventually we will wrap everything with some before and, um, and after. So um, a brief introduction to the trilipo technology starts right now. Uh, the trilipo is, as you probably know, a combination of two non-invasive energies. And these are the tripolar radio frequency. This is the third generation um, of non-invasive uh, radio frequency technology. And the other, the other type of energy, this is the DMA, the dynamic muscle activation. So um, the equation is, is very simple. Trilipo equals tripolar plus dynamic muscle activation. And the trilipo technology is powered by uh, the Maximus that you see here. This is the machine behind the technology, um, or should I say the technology behind the machine? I don't know. Um, but either way, uh, remember the name Maximus because it will, come, uh, uh, it will come later. So again, the trilipo is the simultaneous combination of these two energies. And of course, that this machine, the, the Maximus, allows you also to separate them uh, to do only tripolar or only DMA, and we will see exactly where uh, we use which type of, uh, uh, of energy. So uh, what are the target layers of the trilipo? The trilipo simultaneously targets the skin, the subcutaneous fat, and the muscles that are underlying the skin. So the tripolar is heating with radio frequency the subcutaneous fat, first and foremost. This is uh, usually the target tissue, and also the deeper dermis, where it stimulates uh, uh, the fibroblast of the skin. Uh, and the DMA obviously is targeting the underlying muscles. So this is a simultaneous treatment for uh, the fat, the skin on top of it, and the muscle underneath. 
So how the tri life works? Um, first of all, we are starting with fat melting, uh, where we use the tripolar to safely heat the adipose tissue in order to release liquid fat from the fat cells into the environment. This is what is called heat shock lipolysis, and we are going to elaborate more uh, on that later. Uh, so we. Basically, we are uh, 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 causing the fat cells to sweat out extra lipids that they store uh, inside of them. So this is uh, the first uh, um, the first thing that uh, the first thing that we do. At the same time, we are also uh, removing waste and activating the lymphatic drainage, and this is something that we are doing with the dynamic muscle activation. As you can see here, every time that we uh, contract the muscle with the DMA it pushes, it squeezes the, the, the fat tissue from uh, underneath while the applicator is pushing the skin from above and this creates a mechanical squeezing effect of the, uh, of the adipose tissue that increases the lipolysis, increases the uh, fat extraction and also activate the lymphatic drainage in order to remove all the waste from the tissue um, uh, so we don't get uh, any... Um, uh, any fat remaining in the outer environment. So this is the waste removal with the dynamic muscle activation. And also at the same time, we are hitting not just the adipose tissue, we are also hitting the, uh, the deeper dermis. And as you all know, when we hit the deeper dermis, we are hitting the fibroblast and we are putting them uh, uh, in a heat shock response. And if you remember from our lecture, from the webinar about the, the divine, what happens to the fibroblast when we uh, um, when we uh, heat them is that we are basically activating them with heat shock proteins and then we see that uh, they start to become active and regenerate new collagen fibers. So uh, dermal fibroblast heating leads to neocollagenesis. So again, this is the uh, fat melting component of the treatment. This is the, uh, the lymphatic drainage and the skin tightening. And again, uh, every, it looks like it's uh, consecutive steps, but this is all happening at the same time because the, uh, the energies, the DMA and the tripolar are delivered to the skin, uh, to the body uh, at the same time. Um, so we have a short video that explains, uh, that illustrates how it works. I want you to pay attention to the DMA, why, why it is called dynamic muscle activation, because as the hand piece moves on the surface of the skin, it activates different muscle groups along, uh, uh, along the trajectory. Okay, so this is why it's dynamic, it's not static. So this is the RF fitting and you saw one uh, dynamic muscle activation. And here is a second one. Ooh. Oh, just a moment. Just a moment, sorry about that. So here's the tripolar and, and the dynamic muscle activation. We are heating the adipose tissue and we are squeezing it with the muscles from beneath. So if we zoom into the adipose tissue, we see that uh, the cells undergo lipolysis. So they extract liquid fat into the environment and then the, the, the DMA helps to remove this released fat away from the cells. So we get a uh, shrinking of the, of the adipose tissue. And at the same time, of course, that we are um, also hitting the, uh, the dermal layer, activating the fibroblast of the reticular layer to regenerate new um, collagen fibers. Okay. So this is in a nutshell how uh, the trilipo works. If we try to summarize the main mechanisms of action, we can identify four of them. So first and foremost, we have the heat shock lipolysis. This is uh, uh, um, when we extract fat from, uh, uh, from the adipose tissue. And we also have the skin tightening. These are two uh, contributions are mainly due to the, um, to the tripolar energy. 
And we also have um, activated lymphatic drainage and increased muscle tone. This is mostly due to the dynamic muscle activation. So the idea is that each of these uh, technologies, the tripolar and the DMA, can also be provided as a standalone treatment with, uh, uh, with benefits to the body, to the skin, but they exert most of their uh, uh, potential or the, uh, most of the benefits are coming from the synergetic effect of the, tri of the uh, tripolar with the dynamic muscle activation. So if we're only doing heat shock lipolysis and skin tightening, this will be good. If we're only doing lymphatic drainage and muscle toning, this also will be okay. But the best will be if uh, the best uh, 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 or the most benefits will come if we combine them together at the same time. Okay, so where can we treat with the trilipo? Uh, practically, we can treat almost anywhere on the body. So the machine comes with three applicators um, that cover the body from head to toe. Uh, and of course, that we have some uh, areas that we exclude, that we do not treat, like the breast, the thyroids, uh, the thyroid area, the armpits, and the genitals. These are considered um, no-fly zones. Um, and we also need to keep in mind that different body areas require different uh, parameters, obviously, for the treatment and different combination of, uh, uh, of energies. For example, if you are treating the neck, we are only using the tripolar because the, there is no clinical benefits of having the DMA, dynamic muscle activation, on the neck. Uh, on the face, uh, for example, we are using both, but we are limiting the DMA only to the area of the smas and the jawline, where we have those bigger muscles that, uh, that allows us to contour the, uh, to contour the face. Uh, but pretty much anywhere uh, from the neck down, we are using uh, the trilipo. This is the default program for the treatment. This is the trilipo, the combination of the DMA with the tripolar. And well, it is true that the maximus or the trilipo can uh, be uh, provided also for the face with very high efficacy. But the truth is that the more popular areas to treat are usually the, uh, the lower part of the body. And that is the abdomen, the arms, uh, the buttocks, the thighs, all these areas where people usually want to lose fat. And this is the, uh, the main point here, how we can lose fat in an effective and natural way. Uh, that will work with the body and not against the body. So people are interested mostly in losing fat. So before we, <laughs> we go and talk about how exactly the trilipo interact with the fat, uh, I think that we need to have uh, a deeper discussion about what the fat is and how it works in the body. So uh, let's have a quick conversation about our fat. In the human body, uh, we have several uh, types of fat. And today, it is, uh, we, we usually uh, classify this fat, the, the fat by location and by the cell type. So if we look by location, we have uh, the two main deposits of fat in the body are the visceral fat and the subcutaneous fat. The visceral fat, this is the, uh, the fat that surrounds the internal organs in our body that keeps them padded and, padded and warm and is more central to the body. And the subcutaneous fat, this is the type of fat that we are all familiar with from the drawings of the skin. And this is the peripheral fat that underlies the skin. Okay, so what's important to understand is that everything or almost everything, all the manipulations that we do on the, on the, on the fat of the body, let it be liposuction or fat freezing or, uh, or radiofrequency or you name it, Everything that we do, we do on the subcutaneous tissue. We usually never go and treat the visceral fat unless there is some kind of illness there. But everything that we do, in general, we do to the subcutaneous uh, fat. So this is by location, but we also see that we have different types of fat cell in the human body. The most abandoned one and the predominant type of, uh, of adipocyte, of fat cell in the body, this is the white adipocyte that you can see here. The white adipocyte uh, uh, comprises a very large lipid droplet, as you can see here. This lipid droplet, droplet occupies the vast majority of the volume of the cells, squeezing to the side, to the periphery, the nucleus and the mitochondria 
And this droplet, this is where the body stores excessive energy, excessive calories that we consume. So uh, one intuitive way to think about the water deposit is like these, these are the, the main uh, storage units for energy in the body. This is where the, the, uh, the body stores uh, excessive energy. Uh, and again, it depends on the, on the consumption of, uh, of energy and the, and the energy balance of the body. But in general, uh, we say that the water deposit specializes in energy storage. Although I have to say that in the next slide, we will see that it has much more functions, not just, um, not only uh, fat storage. But for now, let's say that the main function is to, is to store fat. Uh, so this is the white adipocyte, and you may also have heard about the brown adipocyte. This is the type of fat cell that you can see here to the right. As you can see, it is quite different in, its tr in the structure from the white adipocyte. Um, First of all, it doesn't have one big lipid droplet. It has multiple small droplets of, uh, uh, of lipid. And it has many, many, many mitochondria. And those mitochondria, by the way, they contain a lot of iron. So if you look at this cell under the microscope, it appears brownish, as, a port, as opposed to the white adipocyte that appears uh, whitish. Okay, so this is where the, the name brown adipocyte comes from. It comes from the mitochondria. So if we said that the white adipocyte specializes in fat storage, the brown adipocyte is the type of cell that specializes in fat burning. Okay, how does it do so? It has all these mitochondria that one way to think about them is like micro ovens that consume fat and generate heat. Okay, so all these mitochondria, what they do is to generate, is to consume a lot of fat and generate heat. Uh, and this process is also known as non-shivering thermogenesis. All right, so again, this, the white adipocyte specializes in fat storage, the, the brown adipocyte specializes in fat burning. Um, hibernating animals, for example, bears, they have a lot of brown adi adipocytes when they go to sleep in order to keep them to keep them warm uh, during hibernation. Uh, in humans, um, it's a bit more um, complicated. When we are born or newborns, they have 5% of their weight in brown adipocytes. So we are born with a lot of brown adipocytes. But what we see is that as we grow, we don't need all these extra brown fat in order to keep us warm, and we are losing the brown adipocytes in favor for the white adipocytes. And what is believed to be the underlying mechanism is that over time, those brown adipocytes mature into white adipocytes that uh, uh, store fat rather than burn fat, okay? In adult humans, we have a very small deposits of brown adipocytes in the area of the neck and the chest, but this is uh, generally uh, negligible in comparison to the, um, uh, to the deposits of, of white adipocytes. Um, so what is beige adipocyte? Beige adipocytes is somewhere in between white and brown, obviously, and this is not surprising, right? This is somewhere in between, so you see that it has some a uh, small and medium sized lipid droplets and it has more mitochondria than the white and less than the brown so it can store some fat and, um, and burn some fat to some extent. And there is a controversy today between researchers which type of brown uh, uh, of uh, fat burning cell adults really have. So some believe that what, that what adults really have is beige, it's not really brown. Others say that we have both brown and beige, so there is some kind of, of controversy, just so you know. Um, and the most recently uh, discovered type of adipocyte, this is the pink adipocyte that develops in the breasts of women during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, and this type of adipocyte is quite unique. You see that the shape is very different. It, it's not oval or round, it has these small, uh, um, finger-like areas that secrete the milk uh, into the milk duct. And the amazing thing is that that was discovered is that once this white adipocyte converts into pink adipocytes during pregnancy and, breast, and breastfeeding, it can then go back to become white adipocyte. 
And this is one uh, very interesting side note about our adipocytes. They can, they can turn from white to brown, from white to beige, and from white to pink, and go back to being white. So given the right circum circumstances, we can take white adipocyte and turn them into brown adipocyte. And this is one of the most uh, active um, research field today in the adipose tissue is how we do fat browning, what we call fat browning, how we take white adipocytes and turn them into brown adipocytes and keep them this way for a long period of time. So we will burn fat rather than store fat. And this is something that is uh, being under investigation today, you know, in the treatment of obesity and, diabete and diabetes. And this is um, uh, something that we can look forward to so for the day that we will be able to transform white adipocyte into brown or beige. Okay, so remember that the, uh, the adipocyte is very plastic. It can go from uh, uh, white to all the other types of, uh, of uh, fat cells and then go back to white. So uh, we are focusing on the subcutaneous fat and white adipocyte. These are the, the again, this is the most abandoned type of white uh, uh, of fat cell in the human body. And the target is the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So we are used to think about our adipose tissue or, or the subcutaneous tissue as just a chunk of fat. But the, but the truth is that the subcutaneous tissue is very heterogenetic, I'm saying it right, heterogenetic, which means that in addition to fat cells, to adipocytes, we also have a variety of other types of cells uh, that live together in the same area, in the same environment that comprises the adipose tissue. So we have not just adipocytes, we also have stem cells and macrophage and endothelial cells that build the, the blood vessels and, uh, and, a and a variety of white blood cells. And we, uh, and we have um, um, blood, uh, blood vessels and lymphatic vessels and, uh, and nerve endings and all this stuff. It's much more than just uh, fat cells in the adipose tissue. If you take a chunk of adipose tissue and you put it in the centrifuge, this is what you get. You see that the, uh, the fat cells, they, they flow on top. Um, the other types of cells, all the, uh, um, uh, the macrophages and the white, wh white cells, they uh, lie at the bottom. And between them, there is a phase of fluid. Surprisingly, a lot of fluid in the adipose tissue. Okay, so keep that in mind. Keep in mind that the subcutaneous tissue is much more than just fat. It's, a, it's very heterog heterogen heterogenic neighborhood. Um, the other thing about, that we need to know about the subcutaneous tissue is that it's very dynamic, which means that those cells, the adipocytes, can grow and shrink quite dramatically according to the consumption of energy, according to the, the consumption of food. Uh, so if we eat a lot of um, carbs and fat and generally a lot of uh, calories, the fat, the, the lipid droplet expands, and when we uh, starve or, or when we uh, um, or when we work out, we need those uh, uh, we need those energy. The, fat, the 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 lipid droplet shrinks. How does it work? It works by storage of triglycerides, and this is something that I want to dwell on for just uh, a moment of your time. Inside this lipid droplet, the body stores the extra energy, the extra calories that we consume in the form of triglycerides. Triglycerides, this is a molecule that comprises three fatty acids that you can see here that are connected together with a glycerol uh, backbone. So each of these fatty acids is like, um, like a... Um, a stick of fuel, a fuel stick that we can later use, later we can take these uh, uh, fatty acids and release them to the bloodstream in order to use them by other cells for energy, uh, energy production. So again, when we consume a lot of calories, more than we need, they turn into triglycerides and these triglycerides fill the, uh, the lipid droplet and the fat cell uh, uh, gain volume, it, extend, it expands. And when we starve or when we work out or when we fast and we need extra calories to, 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 to produce energy in the body, the fat cells secrete those uh, triglycerides out. They, they break them 
into free fatty acids and glycerol, secrete them, release them into, into the bloodstream, and the body can use it for energy production. Okay, so the subcutaneous tissue is very uh, heterogenic, it is very dynamic, it can, it can expand, it can shrink according to the energy expenditure. Uh, and so the functions of the subcutaneous tissue include energy storage and supply. Um, also very important role in hormone secretions. The, the, there are hormones in the body that are exclusively or almost exclu exclusively secreted by, uh, by the adipose tissue. And this includes the leptin, adiponectin, resistin. These are all very, very important hormones in the body that regulate the... Um, the energy balance in the body that regulates the food intake and the energy expenditure. Leptin, for example, is known as the hunger uh, hormone that is supposed to inhibit the sensation of hunger in the body. So uh, people with bigger fat cells, they secrete more leptin, and this is supposed to send the, the signal to the body to stop eating, okay? Adiponectin and resistin, they have... Uh, um, uh, more effect on the resistance of other cells in the body to insulin. Adiponectin, for example, incre uh, increases the sensitivity of other cells to insulin and resistin does the other way around, doesn't matter. But what we need to understand is that there are very important hormones that are secreted in the body and produced in the body exclusively by the adipose tissue. In addition to energy storage, to hormone secretion, we also see um, uh, a very uh, dominant uh, uh, participation in the immune response, in, in, the, in, uh, in all kinds of illnesses and inflammation. This is why we have all these uh, cells of the immune system around the, uh, around the adipocytes. So the, adi the adipose tissue participates in immune response. It provides thermal insulation uh, for the internal organs, mechanical shock absorption, and more functions that are yet to be revealed. <laughs> and the truth, is, <clears throat> the truth is that the subcutaneous tissue for many, many years, it, it's, it was neglected or dismissed as, as, as part of the body that is only responsible for storage of energy. But today we know that it participates in much more than, that, than just energy store, uh, storage, and there is much more active research going on uh, on the subcutaneous adipose tissue, it, mainly, mainly in the context of uh, obesity and, um, and diabetes. All right, next we have the lipolysis process. Uh, just one second of your time. Okay. So I want to dwell on that for one slide, uh, and I think that it's important for us to understand how natural lipolysis works before we go and talk about how we induce it with radiofrequency. So lipolysis in general, as you probably already know, this is um, a metabolic process in which the fat cell, the adipocyte, releases triglycerides from the lipid droplet into the outer environment in the form of uh, glycerol and free fatty acids. So in the lipolysis process, we take triglycerides and we break them into glycerol and three fatty acids and release them to the bloodstream where it, it flows wherever the body needs it. If it's the muscles or the heart or other organs uh, in the body that, uh, uh, that now requires uh, fuel to, to, to produce energy. Okay, so it's important to understand that natural lipolysis is a process that is mediated by hormones, neurological signals and nutrient flow, obviously. And this is the controlled and gradual breakage of triglycerides into glycerol and three fatty acids by enzymes that reside inside the fat cell, okay? For example, if we fast or if we work out, if we are in, in a condition of uh, uh, fight or, or flight mode, if we starve, the body secretes uh, hormones to the bloodstream like glucagon and epinephrine. And once those hormones are, uh, they flow in the body and once they meet the receptors on the, uh, on, the, on the membrane of the fat cell, they initiate a short biochemical signaling cascade that eventually activate the enzymes that break the, um, the triglycerides inside the lipid droplet. 
Okay, so we have epinephrine, for example, circulating the blood, gets to the, uh, uh, binds to the receptor on the membrane of the cell, initiate a short uh, signaling cascade, and eventually activating an enzyme that is called uh, ad uh, adipose triglyceride lipase. And this enzyme takes the, uh, the triglycerides and breaks one leg, one fatty acid by hydrolysis, and then move it, move it on to the next enzyme that is... Um, hormone sensitively passed. This one takes the diglyceride and break another leg, and then a third enzyme breaks the third leg, the third uh, uh, fatty acid from the glycerol, and releases it out uh, from the fat cell. Okay, so this is an enzymatic process that is happening uh, uh, consecutively and gradually. Okay, this is not simply uh, 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 killing the fat cell. When, when, we, ki when we just freeze the fat cell to death, for example, this is not really liposis, this is simply uh, uh, fat cell destruction, okay? So this is true natural uh, liposis. And then of course, that the released fatty acids and glycerol become available for energy production, they travel in the bloodstream. As a result, the lipid droplet shrink and the sensitivity to insulin increases, okay? And it has been shown in many uh, different studies that linear adipocytes secrete more adiponectin and make the body more sensitive to insulin. And this is a good thing, right? We want our cells to be sensitive to insulin. The other way around is diabetes. Um, so this is in a nutshell the lipolysis process. By the way, the, uh, the opposite process is called lipogenesis. Not surprisingly, right? Lipogenesis, this is when we eat too, too many calories and we now need to uh, store these extra calories safely in the adipose tissue. The body takes those three fatty acids and the glycerol, um, uh, bind them together and bring them into the, into the lipid droplet. Okay, so this is the, uh, the opposite process. And then here we don't see glucagon and epinephrine, we see insulin, right? So when we, eat, when we consume a lot, of, uh, a lot of sugars, a lot of carbs, and a lot of fat, the body secretes uh, more insulin to bring those uh, calories into the cells for energy production. And the insulin is uh, promoting the lipogenesis and inhibiting the lipolysis. So for this reason, <clears throat> in my mind, it makes a lot of sense for someone who is coming to do a lipolysis treatment to consume less carbs and less fat before the treatment. So we, so we does, or she or he doesn't have too, many, too much insulin in the bloodstream during the treatment because the, uh, the insulin inhibits the lipolysis process. Okay, I hope that is clear because we are short on time and I must move forward. Okay, so we talked about the lipolysis and now we are ready to move forward to talk about heat shock lipolysis. And this is uh, the type of lipolysis that we induce with radiofrequency, for example. Heat shock lipolysis is quite different than the natural lipolysis as we are about to see. And this is the main underlying uh, mechanism of action for fat reduction in radiofrequency treatments, including the trilipo. The mission in heat shock lipolysis is to damage the proteins of the adipocyte, and more specifically, the proteins that surround the lipid droplet. And I need to take a second to explain what it means. So if we zoom into the, uh, the lipid droplet, we see that it's made of a core. The core is just the lipid, the triglycerides. This is the, uh, the, uh, the calories that we store in the adipose tissue. <clears throat> And this core of triglycerides is surrounded with um, a lipid monolayer and uh, different, on different types of proteins that cover uh, the surface of the droplet, okay, inside the cell. We have all these lipid droplet proteins. And so our mission with the uh, radiofrequency is to damage those proteins to some extent in order to induce the heat shock response of the cell. So what we do, we apply the RF energy and note the, um, the effect now. We are hitting the cell with RF and we are also hitting the droplet inside the cell, obviously. We're not just uh, uh, hitting the fat itself, we are hitting everything inside it. 
And once we are hitting those proteins, as you all know, what happens to proteins when we hit them, they change their structure, right? Everyone, everyone that has made scrambled egg, they know that when you break an egg and put it on a, on a stove, the, it's changes the shape, it's changes the structure. And the function of the proteins, also the proteins on the lipid droplet, is, uh, is determined by the structure of the protein. So if we take those proteins and we heat them and we break them a little bit, what, what's so-called unfolding them, we are hindering their ability to function properly. And then we are simply uh, uh, dismantling them from the lipid droplet, as you can see here. Okay, so we are using RF energy to induce heat inside the lipid droplet. We are causing unfolding of the proteins that surround the lipid droplet. As a result, we immediately see heat shock response of the, uh, of the, um, the adipocyte, of the fat cell. And the heat shock response, again, it involves the, sec the, uh, the production and the secretion of heat shock proteins, for example, HSP72 and HSP25. These are the two main heat shock proteins that participate in the heat shock response of the adipocyte. And those heat shock, heat shock proteins, they go in the area of, these, uh, um, of the damage and they try to refold, to, to fix, to, to retain the structure of the proteins. And what we see is that during this heat shock response, we also have expedited secretion of lipid from the cells. Okay, so we see a correlation between the increase of heat shock proteins in the adipocyte and the secretion of uh, free fatty acids and glycerol from the cell. In other words, the more damage that we do to those uh, uh, lipid, uh, to the proteins on the lipid droplet, the more intense the heat shock response is going to be, which means that we, meaning that we are going to have more HSP72, HSP25, and that means that we are going to see increased secretion of uh, liquid fat into the environment of the cell. Now, why exactly does that happen? This is something that, uh, has le that is still re remain unanswered. Some experts believe that when we uh, uh, damage those proteins and we are compromising the integrity of the lipid droplet, then the, uh, uh, the mechanism of survival of the cell is to increase the activity of those, hor of those uh, enzymes that secrete the, the do the liposis, okay? So this is like a survival mechanism of the cell. Other, other people uh, believe that once you are damaging those proteins, you're actually uh, causing pores inside, uh, inside the, uh, the lipid droplet, and then you just simply see leakage uh, until, the, until the cell is able to repair itself, okay? So again, with RF energy, we are unfolding the proteins on the droplet, triggering the heat shock response. And as a result, we see expedited, accelerated release of liquid fat into the environment. Now, the big question is, <laughs> are we killing the fat cells or are we just doing some manipulation and uh, uh, that expedites the lipolysis process? The answer is that nobody really knows exactly what is going on inside the tissue when we are doing those kind of treatment, the, uh, um, uh, the radiofrequency treatment. There are some evidence that uh, we see um, dead bodies, dead cell bodies after the treatment, but the truth is that what we believe today is that most cells survive the process and simply shrink, as you can see here this turns into uh, a much smaller droplet, okay? So most cells survive and shrink. Some cells are irreversibly damaged and then they undergo apoptosis, okay? So those heat shock proteins, if they uh, uh, see that they cannot repair the damage, they send signal to the cell to do apoptosis. Apoptosis, this is programmed cell death, okay? But I, again, the, uh, uh, the main concept or the main mechanism of action is not to destroy the fat cells, is to simply shrink them like a very ex uh, intensive exercise we do. And either way, the result is reduced fat volume. All right, moving forward. Uh, we talked about, um, so far, we talked about the importance of the tripolar energy to the heat shock lipolysis 
um, and the damage to the surrounding uh, uh, proteins. But I want to reiterate one more time before we move forward to talk about cellulite, I wanted to reiterate the importance of the DMA, the dynamic muscle activation. In order to do so, I want to refer you to, uh, to this uh, illustration here, to, the, to your right. What you can see here is that the blood vessels that feed the skin and the, and the adipose tissue are coming from the, um, from the muscles, from the underlying muscles. So every time that we uh, trigger a DMA pulse, every time that we uh, contract the muscle, we are also squeezing those blood vessels and we are simply pumping blood into the skin and into the adipose tissue. So this is one major contribution of the dynamic muscle activation. It increases the blood flow, which means that we increase the tissue oxygenation during the treatment. And this is very important. Another, uh, another contribution, this is the, uh, what we uh, mentioned earlier, that we uh, uh, squeeze, we mechanically squeeze uh, the adipose tissue from underneath, and this enhances the lipolysis and fat extraction, like squeezing the fat cells. Um, we help to prevent muscle atrophy, and this is, well, this is pretty straightforward, I think, because when we are activating muscle contractions, we are necessarily making the muscle uh, um, more resilient, or we are increasing the muscle tone and help to prevent the atrophy of the muscle. What many people don't understand is that the appearance of the fat and the appearance of the skin is also determined by the underlying muscle. So if we have um, nice and strong and stretched muscle, we will have better appearance of the skin uh, on top of it. If we have dwindle muscles that are very weak and, and, and atrophied, then uh, it will also have impact on the appearance of the skin. Okay, so we really want to prevent this muscle atrophy. This is very important component of the treatment. Um, so we said increased blood flow, enhanced lipolysis, and um, increased muscle tone, prevent uh, muscle atrophy. But the, uh, the more important uh, aspect of the DMA is that it activates the lymphatic drainage. The lymphatic drainage, this is, this is what you see here in I know it's supposed to be a gray, whitish gray uh, network of vessels that is supposed to retain uh, fluids from the skin and from uh, the subcutaneous tissue to flow it in the, um, in the lymphatic system and to filter it. So in those lymphatic vessels, we see, uh, we're supposed to see fluids and uh, metabolic waste like, um, like proteins, like lipids, for example, and of course, lymphocytes that gives the, uh, give, give the system its name. But uh, the problem is uh, that this lymphatic system, as opposed to the blood system, it doesn't have a heart, right? So the blood system, even if we don't do the DMA, it has the heart to pump the blood to a lesser extent, but we still see some blood coming the lymphatic system does not have a heart, doesn't have any heart. So it depends really on the manipulation that we do externally and internally on the adipose and on the skin uh, in order to activate the lymphatic drainage. Okay, so we really, really need those uh, squeezing of the, um, of the lymphatic vessels that will activate and will draw all the excessive fluids and all the waste and all the metabolic byproduct away from the skin, away from the adipose tissue into the, uh, into the uh, lymphatic circulatory system. Okay, so this is a, a very, very important component of the DMA. It activates the lymphatic drainage, which means tissue detoxification, um, removal of excessive fluid. What is that? Who did that? Can you take it back? Moshi, do you know how to remove it? I'm going to check it. Just okay. A uh, try not to um, uh, doodle around here, okay? Uh, so we said that the lymphatic uh, uh, drainage is very important for skin, uh, tissue detoxification, removal of excessive fluids, and this is especially important in, uh, in the treatment of cellulite, as we are about to see in the next slide. Uh, because one of the problems in cellulite is that it's not just accumulation of fat, it's also accumulation of fluids between the cells. Uh, and another important uh, uh, contribution is that it prevents the re-esterification of free fatty acids. Um, well, this is, um, yeah, this, re this requires some explanation. 
What is uh, re-esterification? Re-esterification is when the body takes all these released lipids and bring them back into the, into the droplet. And this is something that we obviously want to avoid. So if we are doing the treatment, if we are uh, inducing lipolysis and now the tissue is stagnating, is not active anymore, the lymphatic drainage is not active, all these lipids will, will remain in the environment of the adipose tissue and then the body, in order to, you know, to deal with it, will take these lipids and put them back into the, uh, into the lipid droplet and then we basically did nothing in the treatment. So it is very, very important to prevent this resterification of those released uh, lipids. And this is what the DMA also is doing for us because it activates the lymphatic drainage. All right. I hope that this makes sense because we are moving forward and our next topic is going to be cellulite. What time do we have? Oh, wow. I'm moving forward. Um, the first thing to understand about cellulite, which is, I know it's a very sensitive topic, uh, but the first thing that we need to understand is that cellulite and obesity doesn't have to go hand in hand together, right? They, they don't have to tango together. Um, Obesity is something that is determined by our BMI, body uh, mass index. And this is the title that we give to people that exceed a certain threshold of BMI. I think it's uh, 30 for, uh, uh, for women or 35 or, or for men, I can't remember. But the, BM, but, but the obesity is uh, uh, not always has to do with cellulite. Cellulite is more complex um, uh, condition, as you all know, this is one of the most uh, challenging condition to treat. And if you are able to treat cellulite, then you know that the <laughs> the the system, the technology, has a good uh, um, mechanism of action because cellulite is a multi uh, um, um, multifactorial issue. It's not just accumulation of fat. So cellulite involves the deterioration of the entire adipose tissue. And it is certainly not just accumulation of fat. And this is something that we need to be very adamant about and to keep it in mind. And the best example is that, well, not all obese people develop uh, uh, cellulite, although they can definitely coexist. And if you consume uh, um, high rich diet, high uh, rich uh, uh, diet that is rich with um, with fat or with carbs, then you will uh, more likely to, uh, to become obese at some point and develop cellulite. This is true, but not all obese people also have uh, cellulite. And the other way around, we see that people that are not obese, they are in good shape, they work out, they are very active, they also have cellulite. So cellulite and fat accumulation, they can go together and they usually do, but not, not necessarily and not always. So, what are the main factors that contribute to cellulite development? First and foremost, of course, this is the diet, the, the food that we eat. Uh, if we eat a lot of fat, if we eat a lot of carbs, then we are uh, increasing the risk of uh, developing cellulite. Gender, obviously, this is a, a main factor. As we all know, women are much more prone to cellulite than men. About 90% of women are affected by cellulite. Only 10% of men uh, have cellulite to, uh, to a lesser degree. Uh, cellulite also develops due to edema, so, uh, uh, fluids that remain in the adipose tissue, and we will talk about it in the next slide. Uh, poor circulation, this is a very important um, uh, contributor to, uh, to early cellulite development, that we, uh, the blood circulation and the lymphatic circulation are impaired in the adipose tissue muscle atrophy, and of course that uh, genetics and hormones, they also have something to do with uh, cellular development, and of course other factors that are yet to be revealed. Okay, so keep in mind that cellulite uh, and fat accumulation, these are two different things, and cellulite is a multifactorial condition uh, that is usually uh, more challenging to treat. Uh, we have the four grade of cellulite that you may uh, already know, but let me uh, allow me to repeat it real quick. It's called the, uh, the Nuremberger, Nuremberger Muller scale uh, that basically divides cellulite into four grades. So we have grade zero. This is when you don't see any dimpling, uh, when pressure is applied, um, but you still see some alteration and changes inside the tissue. 
you don't see it on the surface, you see it inside the tissue. <clears throat> this is the first grade, uh, uh, grade zero. Uh, grade one is when uh, dimpling is visible when pressure is applied. Grade two is dimpling is visible when standing, but not when lying down. And the uh, last grade is when dimpling is uh, visible, both, both when lying down and stand. Mm. So there are four different stages um, and each and every one of these stages corresponds with a certain deterioration phase inside the adipose tissue. So let's see what it's all about. In the first stage, um, th this is the preliminary stage for cellulite development when, when it's just starting to develop and you still don't see it on the surface. What happens is that the blood vessels are always losing some, uh, some fluids. They, they are always leaking to some extent. But what we do have in the adipose tissue, this is the lymphatic system that is supposed to drain all these excessive fluids away from, uh, from the adipose tissue. But the first stage, the uh, stage zero, begins with uh, when, the, um, when the leakage overcomes the drainage, which means that we have blood vessels that expand, they start to leak, and we have reduced lymphatic circulation that fails to circulate all these, all the uh, excessive fluids back to the, uh, back to the body, and we start to see minor swelling inside the adipose tissue, still with no visible change on the surface. The next stage, we see uh, a progression of this uh, condition. So we see more damage to the blood vessels, more fluid leakage, impaired circulation, <clears throat> um, uh, poor, uh, retention for, uh, by the lymphatic uh, by, by lymphatic drainage and early signs of fibrosis. Fibrosis, this is uh, accumulation of extracellular matrix around the fat cells. And we start to see the visible, uh, the visible swelling on the surface of the skin, the, the orange. Uh, on the next stage, the next stage is already associated with uh, increased adipocyte volume. So this is already associated with increased um, uh, um, food consumption and uh, uh, larger adipocytes rather than lean adipocytes. So we see uh, that the adipocytes grow in size and we also see signs of hypoxia because they don't get enough uh, blood supply. They become uh, hypoxic. They don't have enough oxygen and we start seeing the signs of uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation in the tissue. Progressive fibrosis, early cell clusters. This is what you see here. This is the, what, what I mean by fibrosis. It wraps the cluster of fat cells in, in a sack of extracellular matrix. And this is what uh, also contributes to the uh, visible orange peel on the surface. <clears throat> so this is the second stage. And the last stage is when a adipocyte cluster increases. We have more fibrotic uh, stiffness. Um, more muscle atrophy and extensive dimpling. So what I want you to take from this slide is that the appearance of cellulite or the development of cellulite, it's not just an accumulation of fat. This is ha also has to do with the uh, impaired circulation, impaired lymphatic drainage, edema, this is the swelling uh, uh, with extra fluid, fibrosis that creates those uh, compartments, uh, stiff compartments uh, uh, of fat cells and also muscle atrophy. So this is not just accumulation of fat. So if you see these kind of illustrations, just keep in mind that here you also have fluids and you have uh, um, uh, fibrosis and the muscle is, uh, uh, is atrophied. So when you see these kind of illustrations, just know the underlying, just remember the underlying, uh, uh, the underlying condition. Okay, and this is, these are the compartments of the, um, uh, of the fibrosis and we have the uh, stiffness of the septi that creates those comp compartments and the appearance of um, dimpling skin, of, uh, of, dump, um, of uh, uh, uneven skin, skin surface. This is another example of lean adipocyte versus obese adipocyte. So you see that lean adipocyte um, have proper uh, blood, blood supply. Each cell gets enough blood and we have uh, a few immune cells that indicates that there is no inflammation. 
Obesity adipocytes are larger, they are hypoxy, they don't get enough, uh, enough uh, oxygen. They are surrounded by uh, a sack of uh, uh, fibrotic tissue, <clears throat> and we see a higher presence of immune cells that indicate uh, chronic inflammation. All right, so this is how cellulite develops. So how can we come up with a protocol or a concept for the treatment of cellulite. The first thing that we need to do, obviously, is lipolysis and fat removal. We want to take those fat cells and to shrink them, right? And this is something that we do with the lipolysis. Uh, we also, uh, this is something that we do with, sorry, with the, with the tripolar. Uh, we also want to restore the blood circulation. And this is very important that our fat cells get adequate supply of blood. We want to remove excessive fluids as well from the tissue because we know now that this swelling that we see inside the tissue, this is not just the fat accumulation, this is also uh, fluids between the cells that we need to drain with the, with the dynamic muscle activation. So this is basically what we need to do in the adipose tissue. And of course, that we also want to treat the layers above and beneath. So we want to see uh, skin tightening this is uh, another contribution of the tripolar. <clears throat> and we want to restore the muscle tone with the dynamic muscle activation. So again, when we go and treat cellulite, we must keep in mind that we have to treat not just the fat itself and not only the, the adipose tissue. We need to treat the fat, we need to treat the blood circulation, and we need to treat the fluids and the lymphatic drainage. And we also need to treat the, uh, the skin on top of the, uh, of the adipose tissue and the muscle under, underneath. And this has to be very, very clear. All right. Uh, we are almost, almost uh, there. Uh, bear with me for just five more minutes. I want to say a few words about um, cellulite and butt lift treatments with the trilipo. We see, uh, that, well, cellulite is always a high demand treatment, and this is something that you all, all already know, uh, but the butt lift is gaining popularity um, in the recent years, uh, non-invasive butt lift, ever since Kim Kardashian, uh, you know, uh, did her uh, butt augmentation, people want to have um, lifted buttocks, and I think that the trilipo, well, of course, the time bias, but the trilipo is easily one of the best non-invasive technology today for butt lift. And the main reason in my mind is that we can work with the biggest muscle of the body. And this is the muscle of the buttocks, which is called the gluteus maximus. And now you understand why the maximus system is called the maximus. It's, it's called maximus after the gluteus maximus muscle that determines the shape of the buttocks. So we also have the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus underneath, but the biggest muscle of the body, the main muscle that we target in the butt lift, this is no doubt the gluteus maximus. So we harness the contractions of the largest muscle of the body and we can really bump up the DMA parameters because the larger the muscle, the more receptive it is to muscle contraction. So we can bump up the parameters of the DMA, get very strong, very significant muscle contraction, and of course, melt the fat and tighten the skin at the same time. So this is exactly uh, uh, what provides us the five-in-one approach that we mentioned earlier. We're doing lipolysis, we are doing muscle toning, skin tightening, restoring the blood circulation, and improve the lymphatic functions, okay? So we are basically answering all these uh, requirements here. Um, so if you have the trilipo, I encourage you to, um, to try, to try the, uh, the butt lift treatment. I want to show you a very short video that was taken from a morning show in the UK. Um, you are going to see the trilipo. Uh, in the UK, it's called the lipofirm, but it's the same machine. And the name of the, uh, of the esthetician that is doing the treatment, his name is Shane Cooper. And he is doing a, a remarkable work with the trilipo and I recommend you all to follow him on Instagram and see more of his work. Uh, so let's watch the video. Um, just one moment. One moment, please. Again. 
So these are real-time results, and this is the third treatment that was done uh, on this patient. So this is after three treatments with the trilipo or the lipofilaments. It's known in the UK, and if you if you want to see more of that, uh, I recommend you to follow Shane Cooper on uh, on Instagram. All right, we are almost there. I just want to say a few words about the combination of the trilipo with the cryolipolysis. You all know cryolipolysis. I'm not going to talk uh, too much in details about it. You know that this is a treatment that. Uh, uh, destroys fat cells by extreme temperatures, is extreme cold. Uh, so we are sucking up in this treatment. What happens is the applicator sucks up a bunch of uh, uh, of adipose tissue and then simply freezes it for uh, about 60 minutes, give or take, in order to destroy the fat cells um, in the area that is uh, being manipulated. Now. On, keep in mind that only about 20 or 25 percent of the fat cells uh, uh, in the area that is being treated are actually going to be destroyed. Uh, so it's not total destruction of the fat of the adipose tissue, which is a good thing. Um, Any one of you who have tried, or if you have this uh, uh, kind of machinery in your uh, in your clinic, you are probably aware of some possible side effects for uh, for the treatment. And I'm not talking about uh, the possible uh, nerve damage and, um, and um, bruising and swelling and uh, sensory impairment. I wanted to, to mention the, uh, these two phenomena that we see here. One, the first one, this is what we call paradoxical adipose hyperplasia, which means that after the treatment, we don't see fat reduction, but we see fat increase in a very well... Uh, um, um, well-defined well area, exactly where the, applica where the applicator was, we see an, a proliferation of, uh, of adipose tissue or fat cells instead of uh, uh, fat destruction. And this is something that happens, give or take, uh, uh, in one of every 138 treatments. So a little bit less of 1%. So it's quite negligible, but it's still there, and you should be aware of that. Another, another common uh, side effect uh, is sagging skin after the treatment, because generally speaking, the cryolipolysis or the fat freezing or the cool sculpting is not doing anything on the skin itself to tighten it, simply destroying the fat, but is not tightening the skin. And then people that already have some, already had some sagging skin before the treatment, uh, this condition is usually aggravated after the treatment. And one of the most effective ways to, uh, to reduce the appearance of the sagging skin is to simply do radiofrequency immediately after the treatment. And this is also something that I assume that everybody that is doing cryolipolysis is aware of, that after the cryolipolysis, you need to do uh, uh, radiofrequency in order to tighten the skin and to massage it, to, to reduce the, uh, the risk of, uh, uh, of side effect. This is also something, this is uh, the paradoxical uh, hyperplasia. This is also something that can be treated uh, with a trilipo, although in this specific condition, I would send this client to, uh, to do a liposuction and not, um, uh, not the trilipo because it seems um, too morbidic. Anyway, uh, the idea is that you can combine the, cry the trilipo with the cryolipolysis and to improve the results of both treatments, actually. Uh, today, we see uh, a new concept of treatment of protocol that is called contrast lipolysis. This is when you take radiofrequency, you do radiofrequency before the treatment for 10, 15 minutes, immediately after you do the cryolipolysis, and immediately after, again, you do the, uh, um, the radiofrequency. So you can use the trilipo before and immediately after the treatment, and this should um, reduce the risk of side effect and should improve the overall result of the treatment, because the thinking is that this rapid transition between uh, um, hot and cold or, or uh, um, 
heteroclyposis and fat freezing is having a, a better effect if you combine them together right after the other. So keep that in mind. And um, I think that that's it. Yeah, we are done. What we are left to do, what, what's left for us to do is to go through some um, before and afters. And I just want to warn you that we are about to see some buttocks. So if there are any kids around or I don't know, maybe cover their eyes, we're about to see some naked butts. Um, so first of all, I wanted to share with you this uh, before and after that I think is absolutely amazing. Very, very imp uh, uh, impressive results. And of course, that we need to be realistic about it. If someone comes to us in this condition, not everyone will get, uh, uh, will, will become this after uh, a treatment. What, another thing that I want to, uh, to pay your attention to is that we require multiple treatments. This is not a one treatment uh, uh, um, solution. You need multiple sessions uh, that are done on a weekly basis. Usually when we are dealing with big body areas, we're talking about eight weekly sessions in order to see long lasting results. But you see that we can really improve the appearance of the cellulite. And once you are treating cellulite successfully, then you can treat anywhere on the body successfully. Cellulite, this is the ultimate uh, challenge for uh, fat reduction and body contouring technologies. And you can see the results here. Uh, this is uh, immediate butt lift results. You see that this side was treated, this side was not, and you can see the difference in, uh, in the butt lift. And this is also immediately after one treatment. Um, more buttocks. This lady uh, here on the left, she uh, lost weight quite dramatically and you see that she was left with some sagging skin. So this treatment did, didn't really target butt lift. It, it uh, targeted the skin tightening more than the butt lift. Uh, but you can see that we can uh, treat a variety of bodies, include, including bigger and uh, um, more aged skin, more mature skin. Uh, tummy results. Uh, let's talk about uh, um, the tummy results that you can see here. Um, again, this is uh, this is, this one was done with the tri-lipo. So the, again, the combination of the tripolar with the dynamic muscle activation is very important for the uh, non-surgical tummy tuck results that you can see here. And this is again a very popular treatment, well, especially for women after uh, pregnancy and some more uh, circumference reduction results that you can see here. And again, pay attention that we need multiple sessions. This is not a one-time treatment. <clears throat> and some torso contouring and bra line and flanks uh, contouring and some angel wings results. You see after six treatments, after four treatments, nice reduction. Uh, face results, this, this one immediately after one treatment, you see the immediate skin tightening. This is after five treatments, only with the tripolar, and you can see that the results are quite dramatic um, after five treatments. And some neck treatments and double chin. So again, just to, just to illustrate, just to uh, demonstrate that you can treat anywhere on the body uh, if you choose the right uh, uh, parameters and select the right uh, uh, combination of technologies, only DMA, only radio frequency, or the combination, the tri -lipo combination. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you so much for staying this late and for listening. If you have any questions, Moshe, do you want to take it from here? Yes, I will take it from here. And uh, just a minute. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? I just, we don't have time, we don't have time for, uh, for questions. I just want to say that, that I have seen many, many presentations of uh, body contouring, trust me, more than you can imagine. We've given so many presentations of body contouring. I want to tell you, Duron, I have never had such a profound presentation so deep and so profound and so substantial that touches everything that has to do with the, really, we have never had a presentation that went so deep and with, you did a fantastic job. Fantastic job. I'm sure uh, people can relate to it and join me. If you have any questions, uh, any questions, please email us, contact us. We will be more than happy to address any question. We simply ran out of time today. 
and we will consider, I already got some messages here that uh, people are interested to know more about the uh, cellulite and the butt lift, so we may consider another special s session for that. Dorom, thank you very much for the most profound uh, trilipo tri or body contouring uh, presentation we have ever had. Thank you very much, everybody. Just a minute, there is any comment here? Great job, great, uh, good, 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 good. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.